Welcome to the Brainstorm episode 41. Today we're talking NVIDIA's GTC conference. And Nick, you were also at a conference talking game developers and Epic Games and things going on there. But I feel like we got to start with NVIDIA. Frank, you want to just kick us off with a, a summary of what it was like to be in the presence of uh, Jensen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so as you could expect, uh, expectations were sky high for this year's GTC conference. The GTC, I actually didn't even know this stands for GPU Technology Conference. But in reality, um, the, the GTC conference that NVIDIA holds every March is really data center focused and accelerator focused. These are the chips that are going into data centers, powering the latest large language models like GPT-4 and Claude 3. They don't look a lot like what you think of as a traditional GPU that's powering somebody's video games, which is maybe what Nick witnessed at, at G GDC. Um, but uh, the uh, anticipation was amplified because this is the first in-person conference NVIDIA has held at, in the last uh, five years. Uh, so five years ago, they had 8,400 people show up. This year, they uh, more than doubled that in person. And the estimation from um, uh, virtual attendees was over 300,000. So it's 35 times bigger. The stock is maybe even bigger than that because NVIDIA is now the third largest company in the world by market value. Um, but the, the headline announcement was NVIDIA's next generation architecture for their accelerator line. This is called Blackwell. The previous generation was Hopper. Uh, and, um, of, of course, one of the key metrics is how these chips do at training the largest large language models like a GPT-4. Uh, Blackwell's three times better at training uh, these large language models and 15 times better at inference. Uh, so the cost to particularly infer these models, which is really using them in production to uh, ideally generate revenue, is falling dramatically generation on generation. And the way that they're doing this is, is similar to how they've been doing it in the past, which is uh, adding more transistors on chip, making uh, the chips more tailored to AI use cases, particularly using lower precision arithmetic. So moving from 16-bit to 8-bit to now 4-bit, these keep shrinking, keep shrinking down, which increases performance. Uh, and they're, they're particularly fusing um, two chips together to create Blackwell, um, which is allowing them to, to more than double the, the on-chip transistors uh, in this package. Um, so a lot of exciting stuff related to Blackwell, but that wasn't the only announcement. Uh, NVIDIA also debuted NIMS, which stands for NVIDIA Inference Microservices, which are essentially prepackaged models that can be really easily deployed uh, anywhere you can find NVIDIA infrastructure. So whether on cloud or on-prem or in private data centers, uh, developers that are building on top of NVIDIA's hardware can really easily download these models, fine tune them with proprietary data and then deploy them. And NVIDIA is going to be charging $45,000 per year per GPU as a subscription service for this. $45,000 or $4,500? No. $4,500. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, that was, that I was, was, I was like I was like, wow, they're really, they're really juicing it. <laughs> but actually, the most, the most common configuration for Blackwell and Hopper is eight GPUs in a server. And so it actually does come to like $36,000 per um, HGX uh, server. So not far off there. <laughs> wow. And so, Frank, what, what was there a surprise? Like, we know chips get better every year. You've modeled this out. Was there a surprise here? Was it a surprise in the direction they were going, the speed at which they're executing? Uh, or is this like, oh, okay, this is good. They're continuing on trend. They've been at the forefront of the market here, and they're going to continue to do so. Uh, yeah, probably closer to the latter. I think in this event being so anticipated, oh, there were a lot of rumors, a lot of uh, leakages, and also kind of company pre-announcements, and everything was kind of confirmed in the presentation. So not a major surprise, uh, but what is kind of the the continuation is that they're advancing really quickly, um, that costs continue to come down, and AI is at the for or NVIDIA is at the forefront of that, enabling you know much more people to access um, these models and allow them to be um, kind of trained and inferenced at a lower cost. When you think of the competitive landscape, I think Jensen made note that Blackwell costs from an R&D perspective $10 billion. I think he made a joke on stage. If I drop this, that, you know, there goes $10, $10 billion. How do you, how do you think of smaller companies trying to compete in this space where you do need that type of budget to build at the cutting edge? 
Yeah, it's 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 really hard to compete. And um, there's kind of there's a few reasons for that. But one is um, NVIDIA has built up this um, developer ecosystem and moat around their software and how many frameworks that they accelerate and how compatible it is generation on generation across their hardware. So that's generally the kind of the CUDA uh, development framework that's enabled that. But as the use cases for NVIDIA chips become um, these bigger and bigger language models, they're not just running on one server. They're running really on a, a cluster of servers and, and, and growing to be like an entire data center. And NVIDIA sells that entire system. And so it's really hard for one single chip company that's just making one component to go into a server to compete with the level of full stack integration that NVIDIA has. And that was a point that Jensen really emphasized last week. Um, that that sets them apart in you know, particular the, the acquisition of Bellinox a few years ago was really well timed and has is what has enabled this. And then the the second or third is that they're just moving really quickly. And so while a chip company can, you know, use a lighter budget and be really tightly focused on building a chip to beat NVIDIA's current generation, NVIDIA is a moving target. And so you need to keep doing that successfully year on year to stay um, stay uh, at the cutting edge. And what is, about the software side of the equation? You have CUDA, you have their Omniverse platform. How do you think about that in terms of you know what's next for NVIDIA? You know, it's a hardware story today, shifting towards software. Do you think that catches on? Yeah, I think there's two parts to this. So one is the kind of the CUDA mode that they've built up that has been their mode over time. And I think now the the market and the demand is so large for um, training AI models, the, the large language models and other use cases generally, like robotics and autonomous vehicles, uh, that there is a growing consortium or, or group of companies that are trying to build open source alternatives uh, to, to grow its uh, AI accelerator business, AMD, has their own open source framework. O- OpenAI has been partnering with others and Microsoft, for example, and Intel are working on um, a-, a variety of frameworks to pose as an alternative to CUDA. And so I think that CUDA moat, the way that it has served NVIDIA over the last tw- um, 15, 20 years, uh, has a marginal competitor or multiple marginal, com- marginal competitors that it hasn't had in the past. Uh, so NVIDIA will have to kind of keep the same pace to, to stay ahead on that. Uh, and then the second is just NVIDIA's software businesses that they're monetizing more directly. So CUDA is a closed source developer framework that they basically give away for free so developers can build on NVIDIA hardware more easily. But some of those other things you mentioned, the, the $4,500 per GPU is their AI enterprise subscription, which is now at a billion dollars of annual run rate as of Q4. Uh, and Omniverse, uh, there's a kind of a shifting way that they charge for that. But Omniverse has a lot of components that are seeking to make it easier for uh, creatives and developers to integrate across platforms and to build uh, simulation tools. That was actually a mm-hmm. kind of a key part of the presentation towards the end was um, NVIDIA's platform for training um, robots. And they particularly featured humanoid robots, which Sam, as you know, is a very hot topic these days. Um, so they have a, an open source foundation model called Groot uh, that they're going to be making available and a um, something called Isaac Sim, which they, they characterize as a training gym for humanoid robots. And Frank, you're, you get to play uh, armchair strategist here. How would you compete with NVIDIA? Right. It seems like Tesla tried, but it seems like they're right. That was to supplement orders from NVIDIA. Tesla, you know, has come out and said, you know, they're no longer compute constrained. Maybe that's because of orders from NVIDIA or something they've developed. It seems like probably orders from NVIDIA, uh, What's what's the vector that you that you would go for? Yeah, it, it's it's tough to compete, right? I think I think companies I think there, a detachment of the hardware from the acceleration software uh, built on top of it. So trying to create a open source alternative to CUDA is the right move, and that's why so many companies are working on that. But when you think of how many years and how many engineers of development have gone into CUDA, that's a hard thing to do. So I think it, it will happen, but it will take some time. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, NVIDIA is uh, really a, a go-to choice for most out there. And or you raise or try to raise seven trillion dollars. <laughs> that's always yeah. a strategy. Well, that's a good strategy yeah. for a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, and then, okay. Frank, how far can this go, right? You go from 4-bit uh, to, can you go to 2? Can you, is it just how many chips can you uh, fasten together, 
right? That's kind of like the development that Apple's taken with their M1, M2 chips, or like the M2 Ultras, a couple chips, you know, pasted together. And do, can you just keep doing that? What are the losses? I guess, is that is that just the trend of development? We'll go this route and see what wall we hit. Yeah, it's, it's kind of solving for the next bottleneck. Like memory has been a bottleneck in memory bandwidth. So there's kind of this, this evolution path of high bandwidth memory, which is on Gen 3E now, so like three and a half. Um, and they're including more and more of that on chip, which as you reduce the memory bottleneck, you get to another bottleneck, et cetera. And NVIDIA is basically just an all, all chip companies are just trying to solve the, the next bottlenecks that they get to. Um, it, this is actually the first time NVIDIA has fused two chips together, which yeah, I think it's the M1. In the, Apple's highest line does something kind of similar. Mm -hmm. um, and so they will at some point move to TSMC three nanometer or below, um, which will will help as well. Um, so there, there's kind of continuous iteration happening. Um, as far as we've modeled it, um, we've used Wright's Law to dimension a 75% per year cost decline in, in AI hardware, um, factoring in all of these different things together. Uh, and at least as far as what we've learned from Wright's Law is it looks like that should be able to continue um, based on the unit production of AI hardware and demand, um, at least for now, continues to grow. So that should continue the progression down the Wright's Law curve and continue to lower costs forward so long as that, um, that model holds. So one takeaway, if you could only remember one thing or one thought from the conference, what would that be? Ah, um, I, that 80, NVIDIA is a, um, uh, provides the system in infrastructure, not just a single chip, that they provide the total package. And that's what's mm -hmm. really hard to compete with, both in terms of multiple hardware components, but also the software that stitches it all together. Maybe I saw this online. Is the comparison to AWS, right? Was this like their AWS uh, spin out? Essentially, they're like, hey, look, we're going services. It's a billion dollar business and it's going to be a lot bigger. I think it's a logical growth path when you think they have so many competitors coming in on the hardware side. Like both mm -hmm. their largest competitor customers are going to become their competitors in the future as they build their own in-house chips. If you're thinking of the clouds or as companies like Tesla and Meta build their own chips as well, uh, they may not be as good now. They may be a few generations behind, but they're they're going to get better over time and, and continue to become a bigger source of competition. So building that kind of software stack on top of the hardware is how NVIDIA will um, differentiate and drive additional high margin growth. Got it. All right. Frank, you want to stay on as we uh, switch over to Nick and his his conference? Sure. Okay. Nick, what was your conference about? What were you doing? <laughs> we were, myself and Andrew, who's been on the show a few times, at GDC, not to be confused with GTC. This is the game developer conference uh, out in SF. So Frank and I were the whole web team actually was out in uh, Cali last week. So that was that was fun. Um, but you know, we got a lot of new information um, throughout the week. Um, and I think one of the the main takeaways is we could be seeing a shift in how IP rights are treated within the gaming space. And this is being spearheaded by Epic Games. Fortnite and their partnership with Lego, the company. Um, I think we've talked about the Lego partnership with Fortnite, but there's now Lego Island and, and Lego Creative Mode um, that they're going to extend the creative rights to individual game creators within Fortnite. So Fortnite is moving more towards a uh, Roblox economy, as in you, uh, all three of us on this call could build a Fortnite game if we uh, decided we want to. Um, and now Lego is extending their IP to those creators. So you can build with Lego IP. So you can build in kind of that Bloxy manner um, and have Lego creation within your game. And there will be a share of revenue both to the creator and then potentially back to Lego if a game takes off in a meaningful way, which I think is a really interesting concept in and of itself. And this is really all being pioneered by Epic. So this is a part of their Creator Economy 2.0 initiative. And it's about how do we lend, uh, you know, how do we how do we help creators grow um, from a monetization perspective? And how do we bring more brands into the ecosystem? And this is one way to do that. 
Epic also received, and we did have this as a topic, but Epic also received a uh, investment from Disney, $1.5 billion. And so you could potentially see this extend to one of the largest IP owners in the world with Disney, which I think, you know, will, I think Lego on its own is extremely interesting and this is going to push the industry in a certain direction. But if you, you know, are able to do this with Disney, that obviously becomes a lot more meaningful. Does this circle back? I know maybe this is like three years ago, we were talking about latent IP value, um, right? And potential there with AI and generation and being able to utilize assets like that. Is this just a, another way to, you know, monetize strong IP? Yeah, I, I think it, you know, if you take a step back and you understand, you know, the gaming space in terms of entertainment and spend is the largest entertainment sector across movies, television, radio, you know, all of these different entertainment sectors. Gaming is the largest. It's it's close to $200 billion a year in spend. Um, and that's quite significant. Um, so now what you're seeing is this growth of UGC or user generated content. So gaming's kind of in its YouTube moment as the cost to create games comes down and it becomes easier for us as individuals who don't have experience in coding and these gaming environments are able to build worlds because it's moving towards no code or low code. And then you, 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 you supplement that with brand creation because creativity is still needed for popular games. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to leverage known brands in a, in a safe and moderated way, that will help creators reach a larger audience and also help these brands reach a larger audience. And I think that's what brands are waking up to. You know, we've talked and, and I'm going back to another topic from a few years ago, but about this metaverse concept, right? This idea that we're going to have all these different 3D real-time experiences accessible in VR, AR, on our phones, laptops, etc. But you can't build those experiences as a centralized company. That need, If you were to reach the metaverse of Ready Player One, that has to be UGC, in my opinion. You have to extend the creativity to the masses instead of you know, in-housing developers because they just simply can't create fast enough. That's why you know, if you look at the experiences on Roblox, you know, we were, you're talking about they put out more experiences than the entire you know, AAA publishing uh, sector does in uh, its entirety of its life cycle, right? Wow. The amount of Roblox experiences that come out on the platform. And we have a, a blog out there that maybe we can we can link to on this, but it's you know that creative growth and the acceleration and speed at which you can put out experiences can only happen in a UGC environment. And so to, I don't know if you have the numbers offhand. I was just trying to search quickly. Right, you made the comparison. This is the YouTube moment. What is YouTube revenue versus Hollywood revenue? And is that the right way to think about it? You have like GTA, and that's like the Hollywood and it's like, wow, that's the best of the best and it's great and it thrives, but it's so much smaller than the YouTube. Yeah. I don't have YouTube's numbers off the top of my head and I don't know exactly where Hollywood stands because it changed drastically after, uh, COVID. Um, mm -hmm. and obviously you have differing, you have, you have other vectors of difficulty within Hollywood right now? How do you deal with streaming? You know, where is the revenue recognition happening? You know, we just had this whole strike situation within Hollywood and there's, you know, competing forces there. I wish I had those numbers off the top of my head. I don't. Um, but I, I, I think it, it is probably the right comparison because you have AAA studios and publishers, which you could probably say that's Hollywood for the gaming world. Um, and now you have the Roblox and Fortnite's of the world, which are the YouTube platforms that are growing and building. And that's, you know, where a lot of the attention is starting to be, uh, is, is starting to shift to. Um, and then you have this ability for brands to embed and, and lend out their IP. I, I mean, I think it's, it's only the start of a much larger story within gaming. Frank, if you believe, uh, okay, the yeah, first result from perplexity AI, YouTube was 31 billion in 2023 and 
global box office sales were 33 billion in revenue. Mm, okay. So the, the so, flip yeah, hasn't happened neck yet. Neck and neck, right? Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Frank, do you play Fortnite or Roblox? I know you had what gaming subscription did you have? Um, uh, the uh, Xbox Live. Um, what do they call it? The um, Game Pass. Game Pass. That's what it is. Um, so which you're, been you're, you're Team Xbox. Hollywood. You're Team AAA. I like uh, I like high fidelity. What I think, but I think you can actually you can say that Fortnite is building out a Game Pass, right? As in, you have all of these different experiences and game types now being built on Fortnite. And it's, you know, it was typically, or, you know, it was first person shooter. And now you have racing, you have survival, you have all of these different game modes being built out with pretty high fidelity. As in, you know, the Unreal Engine 5 is becoming the standard outside of internal game engines that are used at AAA studios. But if you look at the graphic quality and what that is powering, some of these games and experiences are, you know, quite remarkable. And I think, Frank, you and I talked about it. There was a bit of a crossover between GDC and GTC because some of the meta human, I think, were used in GTC's uh, or NVIDIA's conference showing the capability. And that's actually powered by the Unreal Engine. All right, yeah, so, that, so was, that was pretty incredible. What, uh, what game do I need to go, how do, what game do I go play to be convinced that this is the future? Well, I think, so the, interesting component to UGC or I guess the, the, the reason it will be so successful in, in, in our opinion is that you will have a game that matches your preference and Frank will have a game that matches his preference and I will have a game that matches my preference and it will all be directly available on the same platform so we could be communicating, playing different games. It becomes you know a central hub for personalized game creation, especially when you begin to embed some AI creation tools. So that cost to create, the, 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 the speed at which you can create, just happens uh, at a much faster clip than previously uh, recognized. Do you think, um, I, f- I feel like when I look at trends, and this is as a player and observer of video games, we're, we've been moving towards like the massive multiplayer games where we're all in the same battlefield on Fortnite or, or Call of Duty Warzone. Um, will more UGC games and more personalization mean we kind of fragment out into our own experiences? And do they need that kind of social connectivity layer? Or are we still going to be all in kind of the same world, just different pockets of it? Mm, I think same, right? You look at like power law distribution and same thing with YouTube. It's like you've got Mr. Beast and you've got the top creators and people all gravitate to that. I imagine the games will be similar where it's still going to follow that type of distribution where there's the most popular and then you'll have fringe ones. Nick. Yeah, thoughts? no, I, I would agree. I think, you know, there's still going to be games that receive the lion's share of attention and monetization, but it's actually about filling in that long tail, which is exciting, right? YouTube is, you know, the platform it is not because of Mr. Beast, but it's because you can go on there and, and find watch this. Uh, and, and, and watch the brain and watch story. this or like a niche video of something that you, you you're wanting to learn about. Right. It has it has both, you know, the, the ability to serve the mass market, but also the personalized market. And gaming hasn't had that yet. Right. It mm-hmm. hasn't been able to fill in that long tail of content when you're going out to create a game one you're looking to raise hundreds of millions of dollars if you're, you know, a studio making a triple A game. So that means you have to create a mass market game. When you have to only spend a couple months or weeks or days building experiences, that means you can start to target niche audiences and game types, which I think is exciting. That's how you build and grow the gaming ecosystem. So, you know, it's it's both. You have to have both, but it's always going to be that power law distribution as Sam mentioned. That that's pretty commonplace across any platform. And, and Frank, speaking of that trend, I saw the RuneScape guy is is back with a new game. 
I'm happy to try it. I will say one other game that's been top of mind, like when I think of, um, and it's, maybe it's more of a proof of concept, but when I think of Roblox, I think of the kind of block style, like Minecraft looking games. But I think it was last year, the game that was pretty much a ripoff of Call of Duty came out that was like Front ultra lines. high quality and it loads immediately. And I was like, right. oh, if I just have this on my computer and play in like two seconds, it's cloud-based, it loads, it's always up to date. Like that's actually extremely interesting. And like, I was surprised personally that it was available on Roblox so easily distributed. Yeah. No, Frontlines was, I think, eye-opening for a lot of uh, investors and just users or, or gamers out there because of that stigma it, uh, as a platform has around low fidelity um, game types. And, and then I'm just asking because I, I saw the headline. I know you mentioned it, but I don't know any of the context. What was the Pokemon shooting game that blew up? Pal Worlds. What was that on? That was, I believe that was actually built on Unreal Engine, but let me uh, double check that. And who made it? Was that part of this movement or was that? No, that was a indie team that built it. Gotcha. I think the story there is it was a very small team that you know wanted to build something in the survival genre um, and obviously drew a lot of attention for the strength of IP, <laughs> the strength of IP. Yeah. Right. Th those are the, the, the concerns and that, that it's actually, um, it, it was, it was built on unreal engine five, according to, to Google. Um, so, you know, that is, uh, a reason why gaming companies or brands have not lent out their IP to individual creators, because you can have situations where your IP is put in, uh, a as in Pokemon and, you know, Nintendo and, and everyone involved in that IP don't want Pikachu or a lookalike Pikachu going around shooting guns in the same way that, you know, Disney probably wouldn't want Mickey Mouse to be holding a gun, right? But there are ways that you could use those characters in a brand safe manner. And that's mm -hmm. where I think gaming companies and these platforms have to be careful but if you think of solutions at scale, because that's what we're talking about, it's doing it at scale that's really important. Obviously, if, if you work with an individual studio, it's very easy to control the brand because they're only going to build one, maybe two experiences. But if you lend out your brand to a platform that has you know hundreds of thousands of developers and creators, your brand is going to be used in many different ways. So you have to have extremely rigorous moderation controls. And I think that's where AI will come into play in the same way that, you know, YouTube and Facebook are using AI to take down videos. I think these uh, companies platforms will embed AI into moderation. So you probably won't even be able to in the developer environment, put any type of unsafe uh, or, or use the brand in, in, a, in a way that the company doesn't want you to. All right. So then to sum it up and Frank and Nick, correct me if I butcher this, Frank, the big takeaway is NVIDIA is executing at breakneck speed. And the big thing is really the ecosystem beyond the hardware. And that's also the vector of competition that they're seeing. Uh, and then Nick, we're at the YouTube moment for gaming and user generated games are what people should be watching and the power that IP can have in that arena. Yep. Perfectly summarized, Sam. I just wanted to show you that I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> Never doubted it. <laughs> awesome. We'll see everyone next week. Bye everyone.